Tati dili, si pa si pa, ay baru sangka, thank you, happy. Добрый день, уважаемые друзья. Как Спасибо, спасибо. Добрый день, уважаемые друзья. Как We're having some technical difficulty in hearing you clearly there from Russia in the Zoom room. So we'll just begin with opening prayers in the Yellow Prayer Book on page one. All mother sentient beings, limitless as space, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience, may they experience happiness, be free from suffering, and swiftly may they attain precious, unsurpassed, perfectly complete enlightenment. All mother sentient beings, limitless as space, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience, may they experience happiness, be free from suffering, and swiftly may they attain precious, unsurpassed, perfectly complete enlightenment. All mother sentient beings, limitless as space, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and omniscience. May they experience happiness, be free from suffering, and swiftly may they attain precious, unsurpassed, perfectly complete enlightenment. For that purpose, until I attain Buddhahood, I will apply my body, speech, and mind to virtue. Until death, I will apply my body, speech, and mind to virtue. From today until this time tomorrow, I will apply my body, speech, and mind to virtue. And we'll go to the mandala offering on page seven. An infinite array of worlds, each with four continents and the wealth of infinite oceans of realms. If I bring them all to mind and offer them without exception, please hold with compassion all the beings they contain. My body enjoyments and whatever I own, my aggregates, elements, and sense sources, my aspirations now and in times to come, as well as everything I grasp as mine, by offering them all, may I be blessed with the end of self-grasping. Completely liberated from the bounds of real and unreal, transcending the names and concepts of arising, cessation, and abiding, coming and going, affirmation, and denial, the supreme mandala is the natural state, by offering it, may I be blessed to attain the state of Buddhahood. Om Guru Deva Da Kini Ratna Mandala Prakicha Soha. And page 10, requesting teachings. Please turn the wheel of the Dharma of the greater and lesser vehicles and the teachings common to both according to the dispositions and mental capacities of sentient beings. Oh,我们都接着人吧,他们接着吧,我是那样的接着接着,接着上车了,他关注车车了,就给我一个送的东西,就走上车了,就走上车了,就走上车了,就走上车了,就走上车了,就走上车了,就走上车了,就走上车了
呃，就是那那点，马上发生个什么事情，什么事情，从来嘛都，人就不从那里，得起来的，你知道，从那还等起来的，你们怕不跟着，一家子呢，这里，这里，这里，这里，这里，这里，这里，这里，这里，这里，
represented by the syllables hong. And they all gather uh, oma hong. They all gather into those three um, syllables. So the single essence of all the Buddha's enlightened body is the om. The essence of the enlightened speech is the a, ah, and the essence of the enlightened mind is the hong. So even though there are limitless Buddhas of the three times, the essence of body, speech, and mind gathers in the syllables amahung, which is why they are very precious. That is, if you understand their significance, then it becomes very profound. So sentient beings in samsara have not realized that, and so therefore for them, one taste appears as a diversity. So to them, um, as it is also said in the Sacramento Golden Temple prayer, appears a duality of self and other, and there appears a duality or <clears throat> a diversity of good and bad and so forth. So everything appears in this dualistic way. And some um, forms appear, the coarse forms appear as large as a mountain, and then there are tiny, uh, minute um, dust particles, um, the fine particles, just like the, the dust particles in a ray of sun. Um, and then there is also um, beings that do not even have a body. So there is large, there is small, and there is formless beings. We speak about the three realms of samsara, the desire realm, the form realm, and the formless realm. So there are beings everywhere pervading, just like the dust particles in a sun ray. They are infinite beings. And yet, they all have a single basis, which is Buddha nature. It is said in the Samantabhadra prayer, when one realizes that one is a Buddha, not realizing that one is a sentient being wandering in samsara. So and this is a method to realize this to realize the single essence of all the Buddhas, even though they are infinite. Their essence gathers in those three syllables, Oma Hong. And so then it's not um, enough just to say, oh, um, everything is, it just, it just gathers. Um, but we need to understand um, um, how um, they um, come together into one, but then how they can be many too. So in terms of how they can be many, the Buddha said in the Great Liberation Sutra that there are as many Buddhas in the three times as there are sand grains <coughs> on the banks of the river Ganges. You can't count them. If you started to count from one to a hundred to a thousand to a hundred thousand and millions and so forth, you would come to no end counting those sand grains. And so just like that, there are incalculable numbers of Buddhas. Uh ほっだちゃ、ちゃ、ちゃ、ちゃ、ちゃ、ちゃ、ちゃ、ちゃ、ちゃ、ちゃ、ちゃ、ちゃ、ちゃ、ちゃ、ちゃ、ちゃ、
And the um, teachings on Mahamudra, uh, we speak about um, one taste of that one taste has appears as diversity, and that diversity has one taste. Um, so there is still some two ways of looking at it. Um, so how can we understand it? When one um, a diversity has one taste, meaning that the um, great um, diversity of Samsara and Nirvana has a single basis, has one um, ground. It all arises from the mind, arises from Buddha nature. Samsara, in, this, in the case of Samsara, this Buddha nature has uh, become, um, has be be begins to perceive a duality of self and other. There is this grasping to self and other. So first, uh, the self has appeared and then other and so this is then how from one taste a uh, diversity arises um so <clears throat> so so we need to understand how a diversity has one taste and one taste appears as as diversity this is the first thing to understand so based on this understanding we can understand how a great multitude of Buddhas have a single essence and how all sentient beings have a single essence. And that single essence is also empty of self-nature. And so then how can we realize this? So in samsara, sentient beings are limitless. They are beings with a coarse, a large body, with small bodies and or no bodies. On the outer level, there is a body. On the inner level, beings have speech and mind. So all beings have body, speech, and mind, um, coarse and subtle. Um, and <clears throat> uh, that, so that those sentient beings who wander in samsara, their nature for the time being temporarily is that they a grasp at the true existence of outer appearances and the concepts within their minds. They believe in the existence of a self-other duality, and they view things as being permanent, stable, and truly existing. So this is the first thing that you know, we need to, to recognize. And so then, the, for example, one good example that ex explains this is in the Heart Sutra uh, when <clears throat> the Buddha um, praised um, Chen Rezig um, for explaining um, the Heart Sutra and he said, I rejoice. So the Heart Sutra, for instance, goes into the detail of how each and um, everything lacks inherent existence. So the understanding that we reach is that all phenomena are compounded phenomena and therefore impermanent by nature. And for example, nowadays in this world, also many scientists <coughs> discuss the relation between mind and the life force. And mind is uncompounded. And the life force is compounded. The life force relies on the physical elements, the outer five elements. 
So outwardly, we have the five elements and inwardly, we have the five afflictive emotions. So for as long as there are the afflictive emotions, we will continue to follow the karmic visions, the habitual imprints within our minds. But it is said, cause and effect or the karmic ripening is the natural manifestation of one's moment to moment thoughts. So the sentient beings in the three realms of samsara follow their own karmic tendencies or their karmic winds. So when there is a dualistic perception, when things appear as self and other, then we follow our karmic winds, the karmic winds. And this is what we call samsara. And so what do we have in samsara? In samsara, we have the six afflictive emotions. But still, even the six afflictive emotions do not actually inherently exist. When they mature, when the mind matures, then they become actually the five wisdoms. But in an immature state, they are the five afflictive emotions. And the natural manifestation of these afflictive emotions are the six realms of samsara. Recording in progress. <laughs> Sanchez, 
Sam Coven and Rangi, Major Ranger Chadi, or Coven and Pama Sanche Unati, Pama Green Water, Sempty, or Poka Sanche, Cajon Majoche, this is Zuba Magona, go Chadi, or Petitako. They send out a good water go to Rome, Machia, they send us yes, I have married, they send us yes, I have married, me, you just read the same line, I said, I'm not getting the check or a similar soul or matter of theatre of Chadi or it. So, therefore, we need to realize the nature of the mind, um, the, na the natural state of those afflictive emotions. But then, so when we, when we just tell somebody, if I would just tell somebody directly, so the afflictive emotions are primordial wisdom. Nobody can just understand that um, if you don't really experience it. So if you just tell someone the afflictions are wisdom, just like that directly, without them really experiencing it, then maybe they would think that, <clears throat> so when I get angry, so the anger is wisdom. So then they might go ahead and just kill somebody. And if they kill somebody, then of course karma will ripen. Or if you beat somebody, you will be in pain, they, they will be in pain. So of course, whatever karma we create with the um, afflictive emotions will ripen as a result and we can see that uh, all around us. So we, we need to understand this, the, the, what is the real nature? We need to experience the true na the nature of these afflictions. Uh, so when, uh, that is, it is based on understanding that when sentient beings mature, they can all become Buddhas. That is when the mind matures, the mind becomes Buddha. So what are the sentient beings? What is their nature? Um, so there are sentient beings in the six realms of samsara. And so how does that come about? Now when you look uh, in, like in, a, in a broad sense, it seems infinite. There is an infinite number of beings. But what is the seed of being such a sentient being? The seeds are the six afflictive emotions. So Buddha nature has <coughs> followed uh, the afflictive emotions, fallen under that sway. So temporarily, um, sentient beings grasp at the true existence, concrete existence of appearances and the thoughts in their mind. And temporarily, it is just like water having frozen into ice the six realms of samsara come into existence. But then on the ultimate <coughs> level, sentient beings do not inherently exist. For example, in the Yamantaka practice, it says, um, ultimately, no true object of compassion exists. So really look into that and think about it. Is, is that true or not? Do beings really inherently exist or not? When you think about the three lower realms and how terrifying it is to be born there, even though it is terrifying, there is liberation. One can become liberated. And what does liberation mean? So is it the body or is it the mind that needs to become liberated? So it's the mind that needs to become liberated. And what it needs to become liberated from are the obscurations in the mind, the karmic imprints. For example, anger is the karmic imprint of birth in hell. Um, Chetumila Ripa had said, the root of the lower realms is hatred. Therefore, practice patience even at the cost of your life. And so <clears throat> when you get angry, um, the method um, to practice is to practice some um, patience. For example, especially according to the Pradimoksha path of individual liberation, now, the um, afflictive emotion is abandoned. So one, uh, one uh, is afraid and one gives up the afflictive emotion. Um, or in a bodhisattva path, for example, we are told to cultivate love and compassion as an antidote. Uh, so there are three methods of abandoning the afflictive emotions. Um, it is abandoning them, transforming them, and realizing or knowing them, which is the Vajrayana. So the afflictive emotions are abandoned 
um, according to the Pratim Moksha. So in the Pratim Moksha, there is an antidote, a specific antidote to each afflictive emotion. So they are, are abandoned. In the Bodhisattva path, the afflictive emotions are transformed. Um, and so they are transformed um, through recognizing um, that all beings are one's um, parents. So they are transformed through love and compassion. Um, and so now in the in the Pratimoksha, now in the sutra path in a, of individual liberation, the afflictive emotions are um, kind of um, um, held at bay through um, keeping different modes of discipline. And for example, in, in we speak about uh, 253 different kinds of forms of vows or ethical discipline. So in this way, one is kind of um, prohibited from engaging in them. So they are abandoned. And then in the Bodhisattva, Yana, they are transformed. And because you know, the root of the Bodhisattva vehicle is love. And love arises first from one's mother. So beings love their mothers. Even an animal, even in the animal realm, a mother and the child have a <coughs> relation of love. They share a relation with, of love with each other. Um, so that is what we need to recognize in the Bodhisattva path, that all beings have been our parents. Um, and then eventually we develop great love. So the love that we have for our mother then becomes great love. Um, and so, for example, when you really think about it, a person that you love very much, you can't really be angry at them. You can't really hate them. And you can't uh, really be I guess, greedy or stingy with them. Um, and so uh, it is from that love um, that the um, six parameters naturally arise. So when you really love someone, like your child, for example, you naturally will never hate them. You, have, you can't hurt them. You don't want to ever hurt them. You don't want to hold back and not give to them. And that's because you love them. So this is how just naturally, when you love, really love someone, the six parameters are naturally complete within that, except for actually the parameter of wisdom, which is lacking. So actually, you only have the five parameters. The parameter of wisdom is lacking because there is this dualistic perception of self and other. And so for as long as one perceives the duality of self and other, the parameter of wisdom is lacking. And from that perspective, the love that one cultivates without wisdom now <coughs> becomes the relative bodhicitta. And so this term relative, as in the Tibetan, implies that it is effortful, it is troublesome, it requires a lot of hardship. It's not easy to cultivate bodhicitta on the relative level. So this term conventional or relative, the term itself um, implies that it is uh, bound to um, trouble and hardship. And we can easily understand that. Um, yeah. Many people understand that how hard it is um, when, when you really love someone. So the relative bodhicitta is really bound to a lot of um, trouble and hardship. Um, so, for example, in samsara, where wisdom is lacking, and for example, parents have a child, then actually the six parameters and the bodhicitta that they practice, it's almost like they they have no other choice but practicing and not or having it, uh, because that's just how it is. Because a parent will not hate their child. For example, as the parents age, they will always worry about their child, and their child constantly gets into all kinds of um, trouble. And um, what's the parent going to do? The parent will not hate the child. The, the parent really has no choice but to be patient. Um, what else can they do? So this is kind of how the, this parameter is really bound to, to hardship. You can't help but be patient and you, can't, you cannot not love your child and you cannot hold back and just be stingy and not give them. You have no choice. So there is really no 
object of hatred, no object of um, stinginess or, or holding back. Um, and so forth. So it just can't arise. And so this is uh, how bodhicitta or the parameters are present. Um, but as the term relative implies, they are bound to you know, hardship or trouble. Don't 这些人的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的老婆的
<coughs> so there are the sentient beings uh, to be um, purified and those um, who purify them, the Buddhas. Um, so the sentient beings, so what was the difference between them actually? So the, the sentient beings to be um, purified, to be um, trained, they all actually possess um, Buddha nature. That's why the Buddha said all sentient beings are actually Buddhas. So when sentient beings become um, purified, then all sentient beings have the potential to become enlightened. They all can be enlightened. So but then what, why are they um, sentient beings? What causes them to be sentient beings? So all the sentient beings in the six realms of samsara, every single one has a mind, and that mind is the basis. The basis of all beings is one and the same. When you look at its nature, the nature of this mind, it is like clear of water. And then temporarily, due to the temporary condition of the six afflictive emotions, the six realms of samsara manifest. So this is the first thing you understand. You understand how the six realms of samsara come about. So through the six afflictive emotions. And where do they come from? They arise from self-grasping. But this is why in the very beginning of whatever practice we do, we cultivate the motivation of bodhicitta as a foundation which means um, motivation of immeasurable love. And as we said, when that is the basis, the six parameters will arise naturally. And so then on, on the basis of bodhicitta, we enter the paths of the Pratimoksha, and then the Bodhisattva, and then the Vajrayana. So we have said that in the Pratimoksha path, we abandon. In the Bodhisattva path, we transform. And in the Vajrayana path, we realize, we understand uh, the reality of things, how things really are. 
So how are things really? All sentient beings possess Buddha nature and therefore Buddhas and sentient beings are actually one. And so even though they are one, afflictive emotions still arise. And why do they arise? It is because sentient beings perceive a duality of self and other. So in the Vajrayana, whoever realizes the meaning of that, a person who realizes that, has the view of the inseparability of samsara and nirvana. Meaning that, as it is said in the Samantabhadra prayer, there is a single ground, yet two paths and two fruitions. So to a person who realizes that all form is empty appearance and all sound is empty sound. So that is from the perspective of someone who does not perceive a duality of self and other. So to them, appearance as everything has the nature of the three Vajras. That is the pure form and when form grasping into form becomes purified, then all form is viewed as empty, empty appearances. And all sound is empty sound. And awareness is empty awareness. So these are the three Vajras. And that is the essence of all of samsara and nirvana. And so um, that, that, that is the Vajra of body, speech, and mind. And then there are, we speak also about activities and qualities. So then activities and qualities arise from a person who has realized that. Um, so what arises then is the manifestation or the, the essence of the five Dhyani Buddhas, um, which is the enlightened um, uh, body, the enlightened um, form is the, um, what is it? Um, the Buddha Akshobhya, is it? Um, then enlightened speech, um, oh, sorry, was it? Varochana, sorry. Varochana is enlightened form. Enlightened speech is Amitabha. Enlightened mind is Akshobhya. And enlightened qualities, Ratna Sambhava. And enlightened activities, Amoga Siddhi. So that is when the mind has matured and the five afflictive emotions have ripened into the five kinds of wisdom. Uh, in the immature state, of course, we have the five or the six afflictive emotions. So why do we speak about six afflictive emotions? It is because from self-grasping also arises stinginess. And that is sometimes like separated into a separate affliction. But actually, essentially there are five and these can be further condensed into the three poisons. Actually, those of you um, who practice Avajakilaya will understand that very clearly. In the Vajrakilaya practice, there is a section called the consecration of the Gila. And in there, when you practice this again and again, you will understand very clearly uh, what is really meant with uh, these five or six afflictive emotions. And that's also why this consecration of the Gila in the Vajrakilaya practice is a very important, very precious practice that you should really practice over and over again. Because then you understand these are the seeds of samsara. Then you can come to a conclusive understanding now, what really are the seeds of the six afflictive emotions. So that is, uh, becomes very clear when you practice Vajrakilaya. Um, so uh, what you then understand is, what is to be understood is that so these are the seeds of the six realms of samsara, meaning that the um, afflictive emotions in my own mind and the afflictive emotions in the mind of others are one and the same. There's no different afflictive emotion. So that is what you understand if you really understand the consecration part in Avajakilaya. As of yesterday, we, we had a meditation class and we have said that when we meditate, then there's no affliction in the mind. And that is why when one person meditates, they can benefit all the sentient beings in the three realms of samsara. It is said, we have mentioned that in the, in the Sutra, the Buddha said that it is therefore of a greater benefit 
to spend one session in meditation than to save the lives of all beings in the three realms of samsara. So uh, in any case, um, again in the Pratimoksha we abandon, in the Bodhisattva path we transform, and in the Vajrayana path we know. We know how things really are. So we know that all those sentient beings who grasp at a duality are confused. A Vajrayana practitioner possesses a pure view. And what does that mean? He sees the true nature of, for example, the outer five elements and the inner five afflictions, which are the secret five wisdoms. That is when the mind becomes mature, when you realize, when you realize that self and other do not exist. Um, so Jimmy Larepa um, had said that I do not see phenomena, I see dharma tha, or the, the nature of all phenomena, which is emptiness. Um, all the temporary appearances that arise out of the confused karmic imprints in the mind are ultimately empty. Ultimately, Buddhas and sentient beings too are empty. So he said, therefore, I do, I do not see phenomena, but I see their true nature. And then he said, I do not see consciousness, I see primordial wisdom. It is, now what we call the consciousness is the mind that thinks that an I exists. And that in reality is primordial wisdom. That's what we call it when you realize it. And when you realize it, it becomes just like space, becomes vast. And it is that within the space expanse of primordial wisdom, all the Buddhas are one. So primordial wisdom and the Dharmakaya and space, they are all one and the same. And so somebody who realizes that sees that sentient beings are just uh, illusions. They appear temporarily because of confused perceptions in their mind. So what appears to us is nothing that really exists. What appears to us is just the projection of our own karmic imprints. Um, for example, there's one really excellent example how to exemplify that. For example, when one makes a film, when a film is created, that is just how the imprints work. So really think about this um, again and again. Um, when you think about it, how a film is created. So for example, when you watch on the screen, how a person on the screen in a, in a film gets up and walks. So that's what it seems for the, um, the audience. But how, does, how is this image actually created? Actually, there is no real person getting up, but it is like the tens and thousands of, of, of uh, shots are being taken, like pictures are being taken of the, this person as the person gets up, then someone takes tens and thousands of pictures of that, and then they all are pieced together into a very short period of time, and so then these images are played in a short period of time that give the illusion that the person is getting up when actually it is just a sequence of m m pictures which are actually um, static. And so, but it gives the illusion of someone walking. So it, it is exactly the same with these karmic imprints. You, you place these um, subtle karmic imprints one after the other in your mind, which then gives the illusion of karmic projection, which is your perception, the way you, think, way you perceive things. So you accumulate a karma which places an imprint in the mind, a karmic imprint, and then that these imprints, when they form, if you form this pattern of many imprints, then these are projected. For example, the imprint of um, hatred. Um, and then manifest as various kinds of threat and so forth. So really think about this example um, over and over again. And this is also explains how our body comes into existence. It comes from this imprint 
of thinking that an I exists, that this, the body is this I. And this is what creates, this imprint is what creates the appearance, your perception of the body, which is illusory. Um, also, uh, Marpo Lozawa had said that the, um, the body, that the, this um, kind of a, a body of um, ripening, when not realized, this aggregate of form is a heap of four elements and the cause of sickness and suffering. So this really explains, um, all of this explains how the body is created. And then you can also understand, extrapolating from that, how the six realms of samsara are created. So they are in brief created from karmic imprints. It is the karmic action that oneself creates and um, each um, action creates a karmic imprint and then one's experience is one's own karmic projection. And so that is what needs to be purified. And so the way we purify it is mainly by, for us by practicing the Vajrayana and the Bodhisattva path. Um, and so here, um, first, we need to gather everything into a single essence. So meaning that a diversity should be understood as having one taste. And then when you realize that, then you will finally understand uh, the, as the essence of the view that, needs to, that we need to train in order to purify the mind. Which means once you have realized that, we have to practice it. We have to gain a, a direct, a personal experience. Mm. リパテテトロテギャサモトナタモコマチャクサンチセンチニジェチリバチジャトチボタオジュレスチグレスオサンチセンソセンテチバレスセンテラテリタタパデバリトウエジェパデテリナフィサモチャテリダソウタカレンチ
So now for the practice of the uh, the Omahong water recitation, uh, so um, we speak about the empty appearances, empty sounds, and empty awareness. So uh, through the Omahong, we we recognize the empty essence of all appearance, sound, and mind. Uh, so we come to the basis. As we said, there is a single basis but two paths. And, and on the basis of this understanding, uh, we first, as you mentioned before, need to understand how samsara comes about in the beginning. And then we need to understand like, how everything is empty. All of that which is created is actually empty of self-nature. So first we understand this is how samsara comes about, and then we understand that Buddhas and sentient beings have a single basis. It is just like one vast ocean, wherein we are all one. Our minds are one and the same. But then sentient beings have appeared um, out of ignorance, which is the um, thought, the thought of ignorance, which obscures their mind. And that is just like cold weather um, uh, appears and the water freezes into ice. So we in samsara are like blocks of ice. And ice is our self grasping. So first we perceive a self and then we perceive other. And then perceiving self and other, we believe in the 
concrete existence of appearances and things appear as real and we believe in the concept in our mind and so on. So seeing things this way, we create karma. And that leads to the appearance of the six realms of samsara, which we perceive as real. Even though essentially we are one, which is just like a vast ocean, sentient beings temporarily have become like ice blocks floating on the ocean and temporarily suffer. So the ice blocks suffer, the ocean doesn't suffer. So all those who engage in practice first must understand that, must recognize the ice block and then understand that ice can be melted. We have to melt the ice. So we sentient beings are like ice blocks due to self-grasping and from self-grasping arise the afflictive emotions and that is what needs to be melted through skillful means. The methods of the Pratimoksha, Bodhisattva and the Vajrayana vehicles that the Buddha had given us with great compassion. So these are all methods to melt this ice block and methods for the ice to finally become one with the ocean again. So in the Pratimoksha, as we said, the Pratimoksha path, the approach is to prohibit or abandon. Um, and then there is the Bodhisattva path, which is the um, path of um, love and compassion and so on. So we need to recognize whatever path we follow, that the root of samsara is self-grasping. Therefore, the antidote must be immeasurable love. So what you need to experience is that every time this feeling of love and compassion arises in you, you need to experience how at that moment, every time it arises, self-grasping somewhat diminishes. So the ice somewhat melts. And when ice melts, it turns into water. And water is what connects. Um, so then we connect to the ocean and the ice melts, we connect, which means that we need to connect to others. So when the, when the ice melts, and we become water, that's through love, then that's how we, how, how we connect to others, how we really establish a, you know, a connection to them. And so, so that is what needs to happen. And that's why we need to have an actual feeling arising. It, can, it cannot just be a thought, but the feeling of love and compassion, experience of it must arise because only then the ice will melt and we connect to others. So this is the... Um, experience um, that you must gain where you then know that this is what really happens when I cultivate love and I really feel love this feeling of self-grasping is gone and so in this way um, you begin to see by through connecting to others you begin to see that there really actually are no sentient beings so when sentient beings have no self-grasping there are no real sentient beings. You, really all sentient beings are Buddhas. So as Milarepa had said, then so first he said that I do not see consciousness, I only see primordial wisdom. If you see it that way, then next he said, because of that, I do not see sentient beings, I only see Buddhas. So if you, if you see that consciousness is actually primordial wisdom, then you see that there are no be sentient beings, there's only Buddhas. But if you're not able to see that consciousness is primordial wisdom, you will also not be able to see that sentient beings are actually Buddhas. So the mind is Buddha nature, and that is the mind of all beings and our own mind. And in the, on that level, we are one. That is primordial wisdom. But temporarily, sentient beings have not realized that. And in order to realize that, we enter the, the three levels of the path to realize that there really are no inherently existing sentient beings. Um, so, but then when we just say that directly, that there are no real sentient beings, then there are no real lower realms and so on then people will still have some doubts about that um, and compassion arises, but um, we still have um, some doubts arising about that. 
Um, so that is why we practice the, the skillful means of the Omahung Vata recitation, because when you bring it all to a single essence and you see how um, Buddhas and sentient beings do not inherently exist and have a single basis, and then no doubts uh, will arise in your mind. For example, when you then reach the Heart Sutra, um, all at, as you just threw it one time, you will clearly understand without having any doubts in, in your mind. So, therefore, that leads to seeing that things are pure, appearances are pure. Um, so, what first needs to become purified in our mind is self-grasping, the dualistic grasping. And um, this is, in the, in, like in the Heart Sutra, like it is said, in the mind of a bodhisattva, that is pure, purified, their mind is pure of self-grasping. And when there is no dualistic grasping, then the like, scope of those bodhisattvas of experience is primordial wisdom. Um, so Milarepa also had said that the mind itself, mind itself is um, already a um, um, Buddha. And uh, recognizing um, that, um, is the way to attain enlightenment in a single lifetime. But what we need to exhaust or purify is the, the grasping at a concrete existence and our concepts in the mind. When these become exhausted, the mind becomes vast and you naturally realize its nature. Um, that um, all the entire um, outer <coughs> universe and all inner sentient beings have this single um, basis. So again, it is just like eyes and water. Our mind is like eyes and the mind of the Buddhas is like water. And basically what you need to understand is that eyes is water by nature, meaning your own mind is the Buddha. There is no need to seek the Buddha elsewhere. You just need to gain uncertainty in that. That whenever self-grasping um, comes becomes eliminated, you attain enlightenment. That is enlightenment in a single lifetime. Um, it is also said that the mind is already perfect as it is, with having nothing to be added to it and nothing to be removed from it. The mind itself is Buddha. So you should understand this uh, very clearly. And once you understand this, experience it over and over again. And so. No, the practice regarding the practice of the Omahung Vajra recitation. Um, so this kind of leads into the practice of the Omahung Vajra recitation, and it is a practice um, now belonging to the the secret mantra. Wherein, in the secret mantra, we find many different deities and many different mantras. There's uh, so many mantras that need to be recited. For example. But if you really understand the essence of them all, you know how to bring it all into a single essence. Um, and so this vast elaboration comes down to a single essence. For example, we have the deities of the new and the old tantric system, and then we have different classes of tantra, for example, 16 classes of tantra and many more. And there's hundreds of different deities in the secret mantra, each having its own mantra to be recited a number of times. But then if you bring it all into one essence, um, it all comes down to um, the, the single essence, which is in the three syllables, the enlightened body, speech, and mind. All the deities have a pure, enlightened body, speech, and mind that is uh, based on a mind of bodhicitta, and all the impure sentient beings have temporarily an impure body, speech, and mind. So it all comes down to those three. And these three are always the same. They have one and the same essence. Um, so think about that. The, the, the diversity of sentient beings, all sentient beings have a single essence, which is they all arise from self-grasping. And the belief in a concrete reality and concepts in the mind. It all comes down to the grasping thought in the mind. That is what is a sentient being. Um, so then all sentient beings also possess the same essential natural state. 
as Milarepa had said, I do not see consciousness, I see primordial wisdom. When you see your own primordial wisdom, then you will also understand simultaneously that no sentient being inherently exists because they all have the same mind. As we said, ultimately no real object of compassion exists. So basically whatever um, appears um, in the mind, this is what beings um, think is real, but actually um, when you understand this point, then what you realize is that there are no real beings. For example, um, when anger arises, for example, also that does not really exist. Then you can really ascertain this point that there is no real object of compassion. There is no real sentient being that exists. Um, so uh, to, to realize that, um, that, that, that is why we practice the Om Ahung Vajra recitation. Uh, so now when we say that there are no real sentient beings, then one needs to really experience that because otherwise if you just think that, then there seems to be some kind of dis discrepancy because on the one hand a contradiction because we say that there are no beings, but then there are so many beings who experience suffering and um, even though we keep saying they don't exist and we still experience it, we, we still it's our reality, we still experience um, a lot of um, hardships and we see suffering sentient beings, um, but uh, we might say they don't exist. But if, so if you still see that way, if you, if you still see um, suffering um, and sentient beings and so forth, if there is this kind of, um, I say, this contradiction in the mind, then that's still a sign that you grasp at a concrete reality. And so because of this clinging in the mind to a concrete, a, re a true reality, that is why this um, feeling arises. But so that's why you need to experience. First you need to understand and then you need to experience and the method to experience is the Vajra recitation of uh, the, um, the wind energies. So um, through that, um, through this, the, the practice of the Oma Hung, you can experience how appearances are empty and sounds are empty and awareness is empty. で、そう Chibuya Tatil 
So, uh, therefore, mainly the Amahung Vajra recitation is a method to attain the state of Buddhahood, to purify the mind. And now in the Vajrayana, um, it is said that the, um, the Vajrayana is rich in methods that require the least difficulties. So, uh, this um, is also a method of the Vajrayana to attain the state of Buddhahood. And so, some Regarding these methods, so there are some people um, who um, have some experience, for example, in a, in a Dzogchen practice, where we, we meditate on the six realms of samsara, that is, we, we bring them really up in our mind, we visualize those six realms, and then we purify them. So we purify the six um, realms by bringing them up in our mind until a real feeling and experience of them arises. Um, and then through this experience, this direct experience, we come to the root of this suffering experience, uh, which is the afflictive emotions, which essentially is ignorance. It comes all down to ignorance. And then when one realizes that, then a sense of urgency of really wanting to abandon the afflictive emotions arises. So when, when this wish arises from having recognized the very seed, the seed of karma, the seed of samsara. And then when that is clearly seen, then actually the abandonment comes very easy because there is a real urgent wish to abandon them, the afflictive emotions. Um, so uh, other than that, um, if um, we, once we have taken birth in the lower realms, like in hell, for example, um, then there we will have to experience the outcome of these seeds until they have become exhausted. Until then, we have to experience suffering in hell. And so at that point, um, there is no deliberate effort to abandon the hatred. But now, um, through um, practice, once you recognize the seed of anger, for example, and you want to abandon it, then you have already closed the doors to the three lower realms. Um, for example, it is just like when you are like, playing a film through a projector, you have the, you know, the, the film box right here that plays uh, where you play the film, but the film is actually projected over there on the wall. So it's just like that. When the comic imprints are projected, they are projected to you, and then you you watch that film. Uh, so and when when you when you recognize that what what that seed is, uh, the seed is nothing else but the afflictive emotion. So when you see that in your own mind. A wish to abandon them will arise within the mind, um, and a sense of urgency and diligence arises. And that is really essential, because otherwise it kind of remains this, this vague um, like understanding. Um, you, know, you, you do kind of know that, that yes, there is this, this lower realms, and, and uh, I could go to hell and hungry spirits, but I really, I really won't, and so on. So when there is this, when you're not, when you're a bit lax <coughs> about it, um, that is, um, that, that is not good. Uh, so, so don't do that. Um, but really understand uh, uh, why is it that I would take birth in hell as a hungry spirit? It, it, you have to see the seed of it, and when you see the seed of it in your own mind, then naturally you will want to abandon it. You will do all that you can to abandon it. Um, because otherwise, you know, when you know, some thoughts of like, desire arise or you get angry and so on, and of course you, you kind of know that, you know, oh, that's probably not good, it's, that's, that's probably not it's probably a fault, uh, but you just don't really take it all that um, I'm serious, and you just kind of let it be, um, that is um, really not very good. Um, you really have to see that these are the seeds of 
the lower rums. And when you really see that, you, you will want to abandon them. Um, and actually, it is said that now the method in the Pratimoksha is actually a little bit more um, difficult to apply them. Once you come to the Bodhisattva path, actually, it's already a little bit easier. And the, in the Vajrayana path, it's uh, even easier. It's uh, the easiest um, path. So, as Milarepa said, I do not see consciousness, I see only primordial wisdom. Um, when you realize the nature of the mind, um, then everything becomes illuminated. As it is said in the Ganges Mahamudra, oh, a single lamp flame illuminates the darkness that has lasted for a thousand aeons. So, in an instant, so in this way, it becomes much easier uh, when you um, bring it all into the single essence, all practice, and you practice it with diligence. Of course, that is essential. If you uh, approach the Vajrayana path more in a kind of um, casual way uh, without practicing really diligently, um, then um, that then the practice itself will not be very fruitful. It will be not be very useful. So now, my friends, please take a, a break for twenty minutes. Thank you. Shiba, shiba.